Hi everyone, Miriam Ortiz Pino here with another uh, Q and A session. Um, I'm super excited about today's session. Um, not sure why, but I got quite a few um, questions ahead of time, so that's exciting. And I tried to get the word out in a couple of other ways, so it just has me pretty excited to to start today's Q and A session. We do these every month on the second. Thursday of the month and it's your chance to hop over here to the Facebook live and ask your questions in the comments and I can answer them live. I'd love to um, see what people are saying and thinking about so we can make it a conversation, we can make it a party, whatever you want. But let's just talk about um, where you can find other free resources if this Q&A session doesn't quite do it for you. You can also head on over to morethanorganized.net. There's some free courses of various styles, one on paper, one on clutter, some on delegating and, and working from home. So there's lots of options for you over there at morethanorganized.net. All right, I'd like to know what your question is for today. Go ahead and type it below in the comment section and we can pick it up during uh, the session. But to get us started, I have this question from Karen, who asks questions quite a bit. Thank you, Karen, appreciate it. Um, and she's wanting to know where to start. Where to start organizing? Well, it depends on what's frustrating you, I would say. Um, the great part about organizing is once you know the actual steps involved in organizing, you can start wherever you want. You can start somewhere small, like a little tiny drawer, or uh, somewhere bigger, like the garage. But the point is, all things in your home are connected, whether you think they are or not. So I often have clients want to do kind of the glamour areas, if you will. Their kitchen and pantry, their closet and laundry room, um, maybe the home office. But the living room is fine, or the utility room is fine, or we don't need to look in the basement closet because there's just a bunch of old stuff in there. It's not important. But the bottom line is all of it's important and it's all connected. So let's just take, for example, ornaments for the holidays. Often I go into people's houses and we find a Christmas ornament or two or some Halloween decorations as we go through the linen closet or the bathroom or perhaps even the bedroom dresser, we'll find something that belongs elsewhere in that thing that you store under the other stuff behind the stairs in that closet and there's a bunch of other stuff you're not sure what to do with it got put in front. So instead of putting it away when you come across it, you've decided to put it somewhere else. So now you have Christmas items in three or four places around the house because you find stuff lingering over the year um, and you can't quite get at the actual ornament storage area. So it piles up in other spots. It's now in the way of other things that may, might make more sense to be stored in that spot. So that's what I mean by everything is connected and it doesn't quite matter where you start because eventually it's all gonna come together anyway. So just pick a spot and start working around methodically around the whole house. And um, so along those same lines, the other thing I see that's kind of a problem there is when people start somewhere and they go around and they do those glamour areas, and then instead of going into some of those deeper, darker areas, they go do the glamour areas again. Um, instead of developing the habits of Nope, let's keep moving forward and then revisit everything because once you know where everything is and where you're going to keep it, it becomes much easier to keep it that way. When you only know part of the equation, you only know part of the solution. So it can be frustrating and feel like you're not making all that much progress in the beginning, but I promise going through and doing just the easy stuff first and then going all the way through and doing the next layer down is going to help you in the long run maintain the order for a long period of time. Okay. Um, all right. So let me just check in. How do I see this? I'm supposed to be able to see this. All right. So if you guys want to put the comments, they can come up um, and I will be able to see them. I'm just going to check in and out. I don't like this um, giant thing in front of me the whole time, but 
just so you know, type in your comments and I'll be able to see them. All right. Next question I have um, is kind of a leftover from a couple weeks ago. We didn't, or a couple months ago that I didn't have time to answer. Um, and it's one that I get asked quite a bit. And that's the best way to keep photos. Everyone seems to have a couple photos here and there these days. They've pulled a couple out for a special project. They don't put them back. I happen to be a big fan of the photo box. Um, oh, I kind of meant to grab my photo box to show you. Um, but really, I just use some, we're just gonna use this box as an example. Let's pretend this is my photo box. You know, the ones that are like uh, cardboard like this. So I would say keep your photos all in one box and as many as can fit in there. And they don't have to be all um, arranged by category or anything even. If you just pretend these are photos. Right now these are planner pages for my planner. So pretend each one is a photo though. You could put them in there and then when you want to look at photos, you go through there and you look. And if you write on the back with an archival marker, it's even better than you'd know what it was. Um, I also like boxes because it doesn't matter, like the Christmas ornaments, photos tend to pile up around the house in random areas. So there's gonna be one or two in the kitchen and a few in the dining room sideboard and there's gonna be some in the nightstand and some in the dresser. They're, they just end up everywhere. So the first thing you wanna do is collect them in a few photo boxes. If you never get farther than that, you're still better off than having them in a lot of different spots around the house. Um, and if you put them in an archival box, um, you are much more likely to maintain the photos. Like they won't fade or um, disintegrate or, or get scratched and that kind of thing. So that's my suggestion is using an actual archival photo box and putting as many in there as possible. And as you are putting them in there, get rid of anything that's obvious trash, like landscapes or um, duplicates or anything that you don't know who the people are. <laughs> or anything that is um, a bad memory. <laughs> Sometimes you just need to get rid of some things. Um, often, you know, people would hold down the shutter, especially once we started doing digital photos, and you have several different photos that are so similar, you, it takes a minute to even find out what's different about them. Think of in terms of stories. What does this say about the person or the event, rather than I need every single photo taken of that event? Um, recently I was helping my mom go through some old photos and we found three or four party pics and they were all, it was like the same five people were in every one of the party pics except two of them, which was a completely other set of people. And so we just picked kind of the best three of those five people and then added the other two and then we kept four or five photos instead of, um, 12. So just think about it that way. What is the representation in the story involved? Um, if you have a huge volume of photos, you can use one of the um, polypropylene storage boxes. Polypropylene is close to archival safe. It is um, at least acid free and um, fairly watertight. So it will, um, it's better than in other kinds of storage. What you don't want is magnetic photo albums and if you were a scrapbooker or thought you would be a scrapbooker and started to pull photos for scrapbooks and you didn't finish them, either finish them or take the photos and put them back into a box. Um, having them out and about and being scraped with all the bits of scrapbooking materials you thought you would use is uh, pretty hard on the photos. So just know that. Um, what else about photos? You could do gallery walls, you can put them in frames, you can scan them all and digitize them and put them in digital photo frames that just rotate through photos. I think those are really fun. Um, I don't have one, but we did one for my mom a, a while back. So check that out. I think it's a good way to keep a large volume of photos and keep them from taking over the house. <laughs> um, yeah, so that would be my biggest suggestion. And maybe a document box or two size of the archival boxes for the larger format photos, for things like 8x10s, 5x7, school photos, those kind of things. If you had them in frames and have since taken the frames off the wall, take the photos out of the frames and then decide if you want to keep the frame. 
So one of the things I see a lot of my clients do is they redecorate or they change things around and they want to change out a photo. They keep the frame, but the existing photo is still in the frame. And it's now you have two things to do with the photo and the frame. So just always think of your photo and your frame as separate entities and you're good to go. That way, when you're swapping things out in a gallery on the hallway wall, it's not a problem that where's that one photo that was with the rest of this set? You're always returning them to the photo box or storage area. Okay, let's see. Let's just take another quick glance. I'm not seeing any comments come through. Okay, I'm just gonna assume we're good to go and people are excited to be here. Um, all right, oh, here's another question that came in over the last couple of weeks. And that is, what do I do once I have the basic one minute mail solution kit um, information and, and, and paper um, system worked out, which if you don't have it yet, you can go to morethanorganized.net and get the one minute mail solution kit. It basically describes how to keep papers um, flowing through your life so they don't pile up on the kitchen counter. Um, and it's about trashing, uh, archiving, doing, or, um, reading. So it's how the paper, all papers, all information, whether it's digital or paper, go through your life. And so that's one way of thinking about it. And this photo or this, sorry, information inundation question came in response to that, that there is just so much information that comes in and how do we deal with it? Good question. Very good question. <laughs> There's several different ways, but um, I just want to take a quick sip uh, of some tea here before I answer because it's a big question. A lot of moving parts on this one. Number one, you can decide what information you want to receive. And even if you start getting stuff you didn't really want, you have the choice of unsubscribing, um, deleting, or just trashing that information and not worrying about it. <laughs> There's lots of things like coupons, circulars. I got three different offers for different phone services today. I'm not sure why, but three offers, three different phone services. Um, I don't need that. I'm not shopping for phone services right now. So they go right in the trash. But you get to determine what information that is. This includes when other people give you stuff they thought you'd be interested in. Sometimes it's relevant and you can quickly tell from uh, an article title or um, who it's from, if it's gonna be that relevant, add it to your reading pile and then read it during your reading time. If it's from someone you don't really want to um, hear from or they give you weird information, it's okay to just go, I don't want it, where is it? Um, and then, um, hey Giovanna, nice to see you again. Um, I will be getting uh, to your question in a second. Um, okay, so the information from some people, it's just, it tends to be not quite on point, irrelevant, so you can ignore that as well. We also tend to collect a lot of information about the stuff we already know to prove that we know it, to prove we're an expert and educated or in intelligent about a certain topic. So if you have a whole lot of that information coming in, just start looking at who's the source you really like to get it from. I have a thousand different newsletters about productivity and um, organizing. But there's only two or three people that are really great at consolidating the information and putting it into a format that I think is helpful and relevant to my clients. And that's what I tend to share on this Facebook page, for instance, and on my other social media. Because I like getting other people's perspectives, but there's only so many ways to talk about organizing. And some people get really convoluted. And since I like to keep things simple, I like to use just two or three sources for sharing that information with you so you don't get too confused because it's overwhelming. So I'm trying to keep things on point with what we like to talk about around here. Um, but you get to choose basically. And don't worry if you miss something, you can always Google it next week. That's the worst that could happen these days with the information. It changes quickly. Set aside reading time to stay informed and up to date on the things you're interested in and get rid of the rest. When was the last time you actually went to your file cabinet to get information about the thing you already know about? A good example of that is, um, I have a lot of clients that are kind of into rose bushes and, and rose growing. 
and grooming and they will have whole file folders full of how to take care of your roses. And I ask them how often they go to that drawer to grab the article before they go out to deadhead the roses or to prune the roses. And it's almost never because they read the information, they get the gist or they get the actual specifics, they go do it, they do it often enough that they remember how to do it. You don't need to refer back to that material anymore. So that's one way of looking at it. If you already are doing the thing, you don't need to keep the source material of how you learned it. If you're sharing it regularly and updating things, rotate it into your current system and then let the resource go. Um, if it's something that happens infrequently, you may want to keep it for a little bit longer, but keep your favorite version of how to do things, not 27. Which is your favorite spaghetti sauce? You don't need 100 different Italian cookbooks. You need the one with your favorite spaghetti sauce. All right. Let's see, Giovanna's question. Um, post a question, oh. Oh, there was a question about um, resources to give a client to declutter a house. Um, I'm not sure about specific resources. Um, I haven't I haven't looked into that in a long time. Um, okay, so the question presenting itself is, about what resources to give a client from a realtor um, when they are decluttering to sell a house. I don't know of a single place where there's a great list of things, but what I suggest for people is to depersonalize. So when you're selling a house, you want the buyer to put themselves into the space. And so you want to take out as many family photos um, and specific like kids art and stuff, you might want to give a gist. Pretend you're giving a sketch of what it would be like to live in here. So if you have one room that's obviously a kid's room, have a couple pieces of kids art in there, but not all the kids art all over your fridge and all over the bulletin board and all up and down the halls. They already know you have a kid because there's a kid's room. Um, if you have, um, let's say you, you listen to a lot of music, maybe have two or three um, things that that give the hint that you're a music lover, but not your entire CD collection visible um, or book collection. So a lot of people have books on the shelves and they think, oh, it's fine for staging. But if your entire collection is self-help books, the people might think, well, the house made them crazy. I mean, there's these little subconscious things that happen. So you want to depersonalize as much as possible. Make it generic like it was in a store so anyone can put themselves in there. Um, and sketches of things like this is a guest bedroom, this is a home office, this is a media room, um, and remove as many of the extras as possible. Box them up, store them in a in a neatly stacked pile of boxes in the garage so they can get the hint that the garage has storage space in it. Um, you don't want jam-packed stuffed cabinets. People buying a house will open the cabinets. You want to keep it streamlined and simple. So one first aid kit versus 27 boxes of Band-Aids. Um, one spatula versus an entire drawer of 27 sets of spatulas. Those kinds of things will help sell the house quickly. Um, yeah, take it down to one of everything, you know, within reason. If you have a family of five, have five dishes. <laughs> um, but you, you get what I'm saying, that take out all the extras. For instance, if I was decluttering to sell right now, I have all of these things in my letter file, um, you know, one of those like envelope and, and resource things. What I would do is take it down to, here is my brochures, here is one post-it pad, here is one set of index cards. And um, I use these other little cards a lot too. They're little square cards. I would just put those back. I would get rid of all this because this is just my little reference material that no one needs to know that when I um, am working with potential clients, I'm always thinking of engaging the prospect to um, get them into a consult so that I can talk to them about my services. They don't need to know that part. So I hope that is enough of an example. Um, 
that it's really about creating a sketch of what could happen in the space. So remove anything extra, all the personalization. Um, even if you have books on the shelf, do things like reference books, like a dictionary, a Spanish English dictionary, um, a thesaurus, an atlas, um, maybe a few classics. You want to keep it as generic as possible is the best way to say that for, for selling a house. Um, if you put, if you leave any art things, do a piece, you know, like have one vase on display instead of your 800 vases that you usually keep um, on the ledge of the fireplace, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, let's see. I don't really have any other questions. Anyone else have a question? Let me just double check. Um, sorry about this. The There's like a, a delay when I do these live things, so I don't always see the um, question in real time. It's better with the be live, but let me just check the other place. I asked for questions this morning to see. I'm not seeing them. Okay, so let me go to the file, the file that has all the backlog of questions that I've answered over the years. Um, oh, I know, home office space. And this can apply to some of the other um, things we were talking about in terms of where to start and how to stage a house. Um, just because office space, the question was specifically, how do I deal with office space in my house when I'm starting to work from home? And it's one of those things that you just don't really think about until you're doing it unless you're like me, and then I went a little crazy, like, oh, I can't start till I set up an office that's gonna work. <laughs> Most people don't do that. Most people start their business in their bedroom, at their kitchen counter, at the dining room table, and then they realize, oh, it's gonna work. I better get a space to actually do my work. And then they try to make a room into an office. So there's that weird lag time. So what I want you to think about, if you're thinking of starting a business, or if you recently have and, and need to just create that space is your office space when you work from home is still an office. So you need to help your family understand the boundaries of that office. And if you treat it as your separate office, it's easier to maintain it like that. So even if your kids come in to visit you after school while you're working at home, they need to take their toys back out to their playroom or to their bedrooms after they when they leave. They don't get to leave them in there. It's like, pretend they're going downtown to a big high-rise office building. They wouldn't take their toys and leave them there, right? It, you gotta have, create the same vibe for your family when you work at home, and for yourself. I don't have a family, and I still have to keep my home office, pretty much my home office, because otherwise I don't get a whole lot done when I'm working. Um, it helps you create the boundary you need to do your work as well. And then you wanna have it set up just with what you need. So a lot of clear space. You want to have um, some tools for planning and strategizing. You want to have your actual computer um, set up, depending on what kind of work you do. You want to still have the basic file things that you need for resources, for dealing with your money, for dealing with people, you know, business cards and vendors and clients and how you're going to deal with them. Um, and a place to store your work product and a place to store any of your marketing materials. So just make sure you're keeping track of all that stuff. Oh, and um, inventory. So any if you sell things, um, whether it's online or in person, you need a place to, to store the things you sell while you're waiting for them to sell. Um, and you want a place for supplies, so actual office supplies, so that your desk can have one copy of things like my pencil cup. It's one of each of the things I use. The back stock is in the drawer next to me, not on the desk in the way. So that's it for today. Let's see. Let me check one more time. Make sure, sorry, the other one, the other question place is right over here. We'll double check, make sure. Um, come on, where is it? Everything's being a little slow, but um, nope, no new question.
Nope. All right. So we're good for this month. See you again next month. Um, that will be November 9th will be the Q&A session for November. So I will see you here then. Thanks for stopping by. Hope that answered your question, Giovanna. And uh, have a great day.